Hey there, and welcome to the Red Hat Enterprise Linux YouTube channel. My name is Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and today we're going to be doing something just a little bit different. <clears throat> As you know, in the past, we usually have an episode of RHEL Presents or one of our other live streams around uh, RHEL 9.2, uh, around some of the new releases, in this case, RHEL 9.2 or 8.8. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot to cover in, in, uh, in, in the new release. So what we wanted to do was put together more of a webinar-style approach and um, we're going to be leaving more of a, uh, we're going to be leaving more topical episodes to RHEL Presents uh, in the coming couple of months. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so for those of you that have hung around the channel um, very often, um, you know that my name is Eric the IT Guy Hendricks. I'm a self-appointed operations advocate here at Red Hat. Sorry, uh, lost my voice there. <coughs> Um, I'm sort of a self-appointed uh, operations advocate here at Red Hat, which means that uh, I, I lean on my, my uh, 10 years or so of systems administration experience and, uh, and tie that into um, my love of co uh, creating content. And so I, I love connecting with folks just like you all and um, seeing what problems you're dealing with as systems administrators, developers, and architects. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <laughs> it's been a rough morning, uh, but uh, and and tying that back into my work here with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and looking to see how we can help uh, solve each other's problems. Um, anyway, we're not here to talk about me. We are here to talk about RHEL 9.2 and 8.8 .8 and some of the new features that have come out. But I also want to spend a few minutes here right at the top and talk about some of the offering updates, some of the direction that we're heading in uh, as an operating system. Uh, so if you're, if you're here for the hands-on goodness, uh, stay tuned, uh, because we will definitely get there. One of the things that I wanted to mention, one of, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, towards the top of the, uh, towards the top of the webinar episode, whatever you want to call it, uh, is some of the pillars that Red Hat Enterprise Linux was built on and why that's important moving forward, especially with, with RHEL 9 well underway and with RHEL 10 already on the horizon, um, so first of all, I want to talk a little briefly about what our mission is with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's funny that a 21-some-odd-year-old product didn't have a mission statement until last year, or at least didn't, didn't really look, at, uh, look into theirs very deeply. So we rewrote this last year, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux is your source for safe and reliable Linux innovation that makes your workload successful. There's a couple of key phrases that I want to pull out. This isn't some marketing hype. This is something that we truly and passionately believe, uh, and that's making your workload successful. Um, we're not successful as an operating system builder, as a distribution maintainer, if we're not making sure that the workloads that you install and run on those uh, platforms are actually successful. Uh, we can we can scream out into the ether how awesome RHEL is and how amazing Linux and open source is, but if your workloads aren't successful, the things that you're depending on Red Hat for, things like running your financial um, data or processing credit cards or managing uh, electronic healthcare information, if those workloads are not successful, then we're not successful. <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention, and we'll talk about this in the technical uh, part of our conversation, is safe and reliable Linux in innovation. I am so happy to tell you in 2023 with RHEL 9 at, f at full speed ahead that this is not your grandfather's uh, enterprise Linux. This is not the old, slow, crusty moving um, <clears throat> uh, distribution that, that RHEL seems to get the... Uh, uh, that RHEL seems to get kind of a, a reputation for. Instead, I'm really excited to talk about some of the ways that you can kind of choose your own speed, kind of take that throttle and set it where you where you need it. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But I just wanted to talk f briefly about what it is that we're trying to accomplish with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And we do that through four main pillars. The first is innovation. I kind of teased that a second ago. We'll talk more about innovation, uh, the way you can build out your infrastructure from scratch using tools like in, uh, Image Builder and Ansible System Roles. Uh, technically, System Roles are more on the next slide, but I kind of tie those two together in my mind, and I'll explain why here in a minute. Uh, but being able to... Um, being able to... Um, uh, being able to depend upon 
uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux to be a development platform. You don't have to develop somewhere else and then port it back to versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and that's that's the innovation tier. And I'm really excited because I, I do webinars like this several times a year for different different partners and communities, but doing this, doing it on, uh, doing these webinars as a YouTube platform, actually get the chat. So I've got it up here over the side. So, uh, Shantanu, good to see you. Uh, I don't think you, you ever miss anything that we put out. So really excited to have you on board. Uh, be sure to throw your questions in there. I'm kind of flying solo today. I don't have a co-host or a producer. Um, but, uh, I will try and flag questions as they come by and save those for the end of the presentation. So definitely throw your, your chat and your comments and your questions into the chat. And I will address those as, as, uh, we get closer to the end of the, our conversation together. So anyway, public service announcement over back to the four pillars. Um, so innovation, it is very important, especially with how fast, how rapidly, uh, technology is moving. Um, I've, I've been reading articles about all the advancements in AI, and it seems like this will be a thing someday. This will be a thing someday. This will think be a thing 10 years from now. And now all of a sudden, it's here. It's here. And it's it's only been like a few months. So, <laughs> so it is more important than ever to have the ability to innovate on top of your operating system. <clears throat> the second pillar is optimization. So you spend all this time innovating and developing your application, testing your workloads on a pro uh, on a platform like RHEL. But how what what good is it if you can't optimize it? If you can't standardize your your builds across your environment, things like uh, this is where things like um, uh, system roles come into place. The ability to scale your footprint both in the public and private clouds bare metal virtual machines, and even out to the edge, being able to deploy the same image with the same configuration just about anywhere. What good is all that uh, investment into your infrastructure if you can't protect it? And that's what one of the things that RHEL 9 is really, really proud to, to kind of tout is that We've got more sane defaults out of the box. Looking at you, uh, SSH uh, root login. <laughs> uh, if in case you missed it with RHEL 9.0, we moved the default for the SSH uh, login requirements to disallow root by default. So you can't just root add server name and and get logged in. You have to log in through a different account. So having those sane defaults, having things um, like um, having things like uh, CVE remediations and monitoring. Um, there's a lot of different tools that, that come into play there. Um, and we'll talk about protection a little bit later on in, uh, in our conversation. And then the fourth is trust. Uh, this has become a very, very big topic as of late. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been things from Bitcoin miners to, uh, to packet sniffers to anything that someone, any malicious package that someone can sneak into a, a, closely named alternative so you think you're getting uh you think you're getting the tmux package and instead you're getting something that looks like the tmux package that actually is is doing nefarious operations under the hood so it's the it's that software bill of materials conversation it's it's the uh secure supply chain so that when you install a package you actually know that it's signed by rel or signed by red hat engineering that is actually hosted on Red Hat servers and is being uh, installed unmolested onto your uh, operating systems. <clears throat> so 20 some odd years ago when Red Hat Enterprise Linux <clears throat> and, and, its, and its older variants like Red Hat Linux really came onto the scene, it was enough to sort of pitch, uh, pitch Red Hat to to uh, CIOs and to systems administrators because of two things. It was open source and it was supported. So that's, that's, this, com that's this conversation around enterprise open source. Um, but now that's, that's not enough. That's kind of accepted. If you're not open source, if, you're, if you don't have enterprise support, then, then who are you and why, why are you talking to me? Uh, that, that seems to be the, 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 market, uh, the market trend these days. And, uh, but Red Hat has grown to be so much more than that. You know, Red Hat is, is 20,000 people strong, and uh, we wouldn't be where we are without an ecosystem numbering in, in the 10 in the 10,000 range. People that we work with, hardware vendors, software developers, um, government organizations, um, and, and that's where we get our, uh, that's, where, that's where things like our security certifications come into play as well. 
things like being able to uh, be used in the medical field because our operating systems become HIPAA compliant, uh, being able to use RHEL as the backbone of your payment processing because we go out and we get PCI DSS, um, being able to run uh, feeling fairly confident in how your systems are configured because we go out and we get CIS. Um, I believe we have over 20 certifications that every minor version or typically every, uh, every even numbered release goes and gets certified for. Um, <clears throat> but we've also been, been around for a long time. I mean, RHEL itself is 21 years old now, uh, so RHEL can officially go out and drink. Um, but we've been around. Uh, we've got years and years and years of experience uh, in the space. In fact, one of the folks, one of my colleagues here is celebrating their 17th anniversary here at Red Hat. So just decades upon decades of, of combined experience from all different walks of life, from all different parts of the globe. And that's true, not just of RHEL, but of Red Hat as a whole. And of course, we still are very proud of our support teams, our engineering teams that, that work with our with, work with support, uh, our TAM organization, our technical account manager. Uh, so you can, you can have a two-way conversation with Red Hat uh, through things like TAMs and support. <clears throat> But you're probably here watching this because you're already a big fan of Red Hat and you want to know what's new. So I, I will I will get off my, my marketing soapbox. I'm happy to, to uh, have a longer conversation about why Red Hat and why RHEL uh, in a different forum. But uh, uh, obviously, uh, you wouldn't be here watching this far into, the, into our uh, presentation today if you didn't believe Red Hat was the way to go. So there are some new th there there have been some changes with RHEL eight and RHEL nine in our offering. So I want to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> and as it is now July first, as of this recording, um, the funny thing is, uh, a year from now, the enterprise Linux uh, ecosystem is going to look very, very, very different. <laughs> so walk with me uh, through this for a second. So we're, we're going to bounce around on the slide, but if, as of May 31st, CentOS Stream 8 will go into build. Uh, CentOS Stream is a critical component in the upstream development of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So uh, CentOS Stream 8 will be going into build on May 31st. Uh, also May 31st of next year, so less than a year away. Uh, <clears throat> Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 will start its maintenance phase of its life cycle. Um, then on June 30th, CentOS Linux 7 will be going end of life. Uh, CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 will be exiting the extended life cycle phase of its life cycle, and it'll ride off into the sunset, having a long, uh, successful career as a as a RHEL distribution or as a RHEL major release. And then uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 will take up its place in uh, the ELS phase of its life cycle, and we'll define what those are here in here in the next couple of slides. But a lot is changing between May 31st and June 30th of next year. Uh, so if you're running CentOS workloads, if you're running RHEL 7 workloads, we really need to start having a conversation because you have exactly 395 days from right now to go out and figure out what you're doing with those RHEL 6, RHEL 7, and CentOS Linux 7 uh, systems. And stay tuned to the, to the RHEL YouTube channel and to the RHEL product blog uh, over the coming months as we're going to be talking very heavily on that. Um, I'm working, uh, I'm working, uh, with, with a lot of our team to produce content around what to, uh, how to do in place upgrades, how to do, how you might consider doing a lift and shift with something like image builder, uh, and, um, and then with the, uh, with the departure of CentOS Linux seven. So I mentioned, I mentioned a couple of different phases and I'm actually going to skip ahead here to the next slide to, to kind of talk through this a little bit. So with the release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 about four years ago, uh, we moved to a predictable release model and to a standardized uh, support cadence. So I, I know those are, those are words that may not mean much um, in, in out of order, but let me explain. So <clears throat> with RHEL 8 and RHEL 9, they get five years of full support. So that means all the feature enhancements, the hardware enablement, the new kernel, um, all of those things... Um, and uh, and a and a specific uh, release cadence or specific SLA for um, bug fixes and security errata. So that's the first five years. The second five years of our standard ten-year life cycle is uh, maintenance support, 
And what that looks like is uh, you don't get any anything new, but you do get security feature or you do get security fixes. You do get critical bug fixes backported uh, from the current fully supported operating system uh, back into the, uh, into the maintenance support. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, um, so that's our standard 10 year life cycle that, that comes complete with any, uh, Red Hat subscription, Red Hat Enterprise Linux subscription that you get. And that is for 10 years for each, um, for each operating system. I also mentioned that we went to a predictable uh, release cadence. And what that means is we do three years between major versions. So RHEL 8 is now four years old. RHEL 9 is one year old. And you you heard it here first, folks. I can pretty well tell you that by this time, two years from now, we'll be running on RHEL 10.0. Um, so don't tell anybody else. Actually, tell everyone else. Um, because um, we, we've moved to that predictable release cadence. So you, and then you can get an idea of when to expect that release by just doing some basic mathematics on our minor releases that come out every six months. So um, about three weeks ago, I think for, I, I think it's three weeks now. Um, we went through release two weeks of release and then Red Hat Summit. So I'm still a little brain still a little muddled, but uh, um, about three weeks ago, Rel 9.2 was released, and then two weeks ago. Yeah, this sounds right. Rel 8.8 uh, was released. <coughs> and so you can imagine, you can get a good idea of when to have some resources available to look at the next minor release uh, because you can add, you know, May plus six months and get a good idea of about when to start expecting that next uh, minor release. And that can help you, that can help you uh, plan resource availability if you have to certify your application or your, your infrastructure stack on things like uh, for, for certain workloads or for certain environments, um, looking at things like GovCloud maybe, um, you've got an idea of when to expect that uh, to come out. So predictable release cadence, three months or three, three year major release, six month minor release, and then um, a standardized life cycle, five years of full support, five years of maintenance support, and then we've got a two year add on for your subscription for that extended lifecycle support. Now I'm going to jump back to uh, back to the previous slide. So you notice that RHEL 6 is right at the end of, of, of its time of its time frame. It's been around for over 11 years, and it has it it was one of the first operating systems that I ever um, that I ever utilized. Uh, RHEL 5 was actually the first, maybe RHEL 4, um, but RHEL 6 was like the the majority of my workload, and then RHEL 7. Um, so you'll notice that, that RHEL 6 is about to ride off into the sunset um, and will no longer be offered as an ELS add-on. And then uh, RHEL 7 <clears throat> will be moving into that ELS phase. Um, so it, if you're running any RHEL 7 systems after June 30th of next year, 395 days from today, um, you, will, uh, you will need that ELS add-on to continue running in a supported fashion. Uh, and that's for two years. But my hope over the next year is to help work with each and every one of you uh, to get into a cadence where we're not in the situation where you may have RHEL 6 systems on ELS, uh, which, does, which is a paid add-on, where you've got RHEL 7 going into ELS. You've got, um, you've got community-supported distributions, things like CentOS Linux, that are going end of life. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really hoping to help move, move us all into a cadence where you can do in-place upgrades, where you can do quarterly or every six month or monthly patch cycles, something to keep your systems up to date. Um, so as RHEL 6 moves off, as RHEL 7 moves into ELS, we've got RHEL 8 moving into maintenance support. The only thing that isn't changing on that, on that slide is that RHEL 9 will be in full support until I believe May of 2027. Um, so all of this is actually public information. So um, it's hard to tell on the slides, but I will put this all in the show notes over the next couple of hours. Um, I'll put links to our lifecycle page that has some of the dates published. Um, but you may actually want to try and grab a screenshot of that slide and um, uh, grab a, a screenshot uh, of that slide so you know so you have all the versions and all the dates laid out there. <clears throat> So I mentioned that we had some offering updates as well. Sorry, I kind of got bogged down in the in the details there. I'll, I'll try and, and pick up the pace a little bit. 
But uh, I'm actually going to jump ahead to the uh, uh, Rel 9 uh, minor release schedule. So you can see that we've got, we've got minor releases every six months all the way up to Rel 9.10. Uh, which will be the final minor release of uh, of RHEL 9. Uh, we just released 9.2, and you notice that the even-numbered releases have a little bit longer life cycle. And I'm really excited because um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Shantanu and uh, Shantanu and Aaron are, are getting ahead of me here with the in-place upgrade conversation. Uh, Bear with me. I, I see I see your questions and your comments. We'll we'll get to in place upgrades here in just a minute. Uh, sorry, uh, saw a shiny object over here. Um, so, <laughs> so minor releases come out every six months, and you may be saying, Eric, that is just too much. We can't recertify our stack that often. Well, the good news is you can actually stay on even numbered releases, which means you could recertify once a year. Or you can get our EUS add-on. So don't don't confuse that with ELS, which is lifecycle. EUS is updates, which is minor releases. Um, you can actually get uh, yeah, squirrel. Uh, you can actually get um, you can actually stay on even numbered minor releases for up to two years uh, with with uh, with the EUS add-on. So what that means is if you require certified applications or if you require your applications to be certified or if your vendor needs to certify, um, <clears throat> then you can actually stay on even numbered releases and only update between those even numbers. Um, or you can kind of park your operating system on a specific EOS release for up to two years. Now, that said, we have certain cases like our partnership with SAP where it takes quite some time, especially between majors, to get uh, that workload certified on on an operating system, because certain certain environments, certain certifications require everything to be recertified uh, every time that say the kernel number or the release version of of the distribution changes. And so what we'd seen with SAP in particular is that two years wasn't quite enough. By the time this two year certification process was done, then it was time to move on to the next one. So it didn't give you a lot of time to kind of park and catch your breath. That's why at Summit. Um, last week, we actually an announced enhanced extended update support. Don't yell at me, I didn't name this, but EEUS, it's it's more E, so if two years is good, four years must be better, right? <coughs> and this is where I was kind of hinting that you can kind of choose your own speed. Do you want to patch monthly? Do you want to patch quarterly? Or do you want to patch add minor releases? Do you want to do two-year EUS? Do you want to do four-year EUS? And so I tell you, this is not your grandfather's Linux. You're not stuck running older versions of the operating system. But if you need to, we have these offerings available. So this will I, I this was announced at Summit. I believe uh, we're we're letting the I believe we're letting the ink dry on this. So I I'm not certain, but I believe this will be available in Q3. So just a couple of months from now, as things kind of get uh, get fleshed out. But this starting with Rel 9.0, you'll be able to use it enhanced. Extended Update Support, EEUS. Um, this is very similar to E4S if you're, say, an SAP customer. Um, similar thing, but this is for general consumption. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, as I mentioned, I'm kind of flying solo today. Um, let me double check the chat here. Um, Shantanu says that uh, that uh, can definitely vouch for RHEL just works which is what I love. The problem with being a systems administrator is you're only noticed when something breaks, but um, but uh, anyway, I won't go down that rabbit trail. Uh, had a question about building your own minimal uh, distribution, so not a recompile, um, but uh, so, uh, and then and then I noticed that, that Aaron actually uh, read my mind and suggested using Image Builder to get that uh, to get a minimal uh, operating system. So the minimal install, the one that comes right out of the box if you're using image builder actually um, uh, actually use is, is the bare minimum. The bare number of packages I think it's like 600 packages, maybe less. And then actually uh, on top of that it's it's like less than two gigs of space um, to install from scratch. I don't recommend building a two gig uh, disk, but if that's not minimal enough for you, then uh, then we need to talk. <coughs> if you need something more minimal than that, look at something like UBI containers. Um, 
And then uh, then one last question, and then we'll dive back into the deck here. Uh, is RHEL UBI, uh, which j does have uh, version 9 and version 8 images, free for commercial use? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so yes, I will. I would redirect you to the FAQs, but it is uh, those packages. Uh, those those uh, UBI images are there for for uh, uh, for use. They're they're redistributable, um, <clears throat> and uh, so highly encourage you to look at UBI and some of the use cases around that. Um, so here's here's the uh, part of the conversation that I was I was noticing. <laughs> <coughs> Man, goodness, excuse me. Um, so in place upgrades, we're going to talk about that next because there are basically two different avenues that you can go. And I might actually just hang on this slide here for a minute because I, I want to talk about what I'm seeing. Um, so keep in mind that as a technical marketing manager, which is my official title here at Red Hat, uh, I write a lot of the, write a lot of the release content and I work with, with our different teams to, to make sure that their new feature, their new functionality is well represented in things like press releases, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of the technical side of, uh, I'm sort of the technical side for our releases for that. Um, but what I'm really excited about, uh, well, the, I kind of had this split brain issue on this topic. Because as a former systems administrator, Lord knows I carry my scars. But here's the thing. I represent both image builder, <laughs> in-place upgrades, and convert to rel. So I could tell you two completely different stories, and both would be completely viable. So in very short, the first one is I've got, I've got all this legacy stuff, and I need to keep tagging it, dragging it along. I need to keep using it until it, the application retires or until we can get a new version of software or until, um, you know, until the, the application just falls down dead and we can't support it anymore. Been there, done that. It's never fun. Uh, we had a Microsoft Windows server that was running open VMS in a virtual machine with like six terabytes of database data for years of this mid-sized company that I used to work for as a systems administrator. So you talk about legacy debt. I feel your pain. Trust me, I do. Um, so you could take something like CentOS Linux 7 system and do a convert to RHEL, and that puts you on RHEL 7. <coughs> That's easy enough to do, and it's pretty straightforward. We'll talk about that here in a couple of slides. The other option is that you'd then be stuck with, instead of a community operating system that's no longer in existence, or th that iteration, CentOS Linux, not CentOS Stream, CentOS Linux, um, you could then move into, uh, then you're, then you're kind of stuck at RHEL 7.9, which then means that, oh no, now I've got ELS, e so now what am I to do? Well, then you can do an in-place upgrade to RHEL 8. We'll talk about that specific use case here in a minute because we also made an, an announcement around that at Summit as well. <clears throat> and then theoretically, depending on the workload that you're running, you could even do an in-place upgrade to RHEL 9. However, as a former systems administrator, don't tell the Leap team that I t I'm telling you this, but you're talking about going from CentOS Linux 7 to RHEL 9 in the matter of a couple of hops. The underlying Python libraries, the kernel the uh, the runtimes, whatever application you're using, you would have to be able to ensure that at every at each leap that you revalidate your application to make sure that everything works appropriately. Now, if this is something that you're running, maybe it's Nginx or um, Apache Tomcat. Maybe it's it, maybe it's one of those things <clears throat> that's available within the Red Hat repos, and you're not doing any customizations on top. You're not using any features that have been deprecated in the last five years you could very easily go from CentOS Linux 7 to RHEL 7 to RHEL 8 to RHEL 9. And I usually get asked the question at this point, can I go straight from RHEL 7 to RHEL 9? Not exactly. <clears throat> it's not one hop. It's two hops. Um, and, and there it is. Thank you, Aaron. Um, <laughs> um, so the you have to go from RHEL 7.latest to, to RHEL 8. And <clears throat> you're talking about a huge leap in, uh, pun intended, uh, you're talking about a huge leap in how to, uh, in, in all the underlying uh, uh, information. So it's it's not technically feasible within the tool, but it's also not advisable. It'd be better to do that leap from seven to eight and then pause 
and then run a pre-upgrade assessment on the RHEL 8 box to make sure you don't run across any inhibitors, that, uh, that you don't run, in, run across any issues that um, might, might break your application or break the upgrade to RHEL 9. But it is possible to do so in one outage window because um, I've got videos out on our YouTube channel and blog posts that talk about this, but here in my home lab, uh, on a vanilla system, I can usually do an in-place upgrade by hand in about 15 to 20 minutes. Keep in mind that's consumer-grade hardware with no customizations and no major workloads. But So you could figure that if you take a couple of hours, um, <coughs> if you take a couple of hours per system or doing it at, in, at, in bulk, you can actually do that. Um, uh, you can actually make that leap from 7 to 8 to 9, but you can't go from 7 to 9. Okay, so I've, I've kind of... I've kind of rabbit trailed over on that. So that's one use case. You can use convert to rel and in place upgrades to keep that legacy debt coming along. But however, is that something you really want to do? Or do you want to use one of our new offerings that I'm going to talk about here in a couple of slides to buy yourself some time with that legacy debt to do a conversion from say CentOS Linux 7 to, to rel 7 or use ELS on rel 7 and use that requisite time to then build out your infrastructure from scratch using things, excuse me, like, like image builder, like, um, <coughs> like system roles, using some of our tools like satellite and Ansible automation platform to build out more, a more sane infrastructure moving forward. Um, because as, as we'll see, as we talk about leap, Leap is our tool going forward for in-place upgrades. It's based on the upstream work of, of, uh, that we've seen on Fedora Linux. The machine I'm running on today is Fedora Linux 38. This particular piece of hardware I've done in-place upgrades on since Fedora Linux 34, 35. Uh, I actually had a workstation for a long time that was even older, like into the late Fedora Linux 20s. So that in-place upgrade mechanism has gotten so incredibly smooth under Fedora. And that is what has been feeding the RHEL in-place upgrade tooling for the last several ma uh, major releases. So it's you, you got to pick your poison here. It's, it's choose your own adventure. How do you want to get to a state where you are well-supported, where you can maintain your infrastructure so we don't end up in, t in this June 30th, 2024 situation again, where all of a sudden you wake up one day and your entire infrastructure is no longer supportable. So... With that said, let me talk about some of the some of the features and some of the um, uh, and some of the new offerings that we've got around this. Trust me, over the next year, this is probably the conversation I'm going to have with folks the most. <coughs> but as I say that, I forgot my own deck. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, as, as you may have as you may recall, uh, around February or so of last year, we actually introduced uh, uh, rel support for ARM architectures. Um, and we are continuing to grow our ARM uh, footprint. Now, this doesn't mean that you can grab any ARM box off the shelf and install RHEL on it and get support. Uh, right now, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is supported on system-ready only platforms. If you're not sure what that is, I'll make sure to put in the show notes a link to a system, uh, a link to the developer blog for ARM that talks about what system ready is, but in short, it is basically a set of loosely agreed upon standards of what an ARM chip should look like, um, gets into the hardware specs, that kind of thing. But at a high level, it's just, these are things that the ARM community th thinks should exist in all ARM platforms. And then I've also got a link and I'll make sure to share that in the show notes as well uh, to Red Hat supported catalog. But with each minor release since last year, we've uh, since the announcement of RHEL 9, we've been adding to that catalog slowly but surely. Uh, it's there's both the strength and the strain of, of ARM not being a single company behind it is that you get to support a whole lot more use cases, but at the same time, it's it's kind of a one-off type approach for each of those uh, each of those scenarios. But probably the biggest announcement for RHEL 9.2 is we now have 64K page-sized kernels. Try and say that five times fast. I tried last night. It didn't work. Um, but uh, you can now choose whether to use a 4K kernel or a 64K kernel. And if you have a workload that would benefit from this, you probably know who you are. <coughs> um and uh, so, so that is now an option when you build a RHEL system for ARM is you can use that 64K page kernel size, which under certain workloads drastically increase, increases the performance and memory footprint of that workload. 
Um, so if if you have a workload that probably suits that, you probably know who you are. <laughs> I admittedly don't don't uh, don't fully grok what what that means. But now here's here's the section I was thinking about a minute ago. It's always fun to uh, to go co-present with me because you never know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so. CentOS Linux 7, you have 395 days from today to decide what you're doing with those boxes and move. Um, because after that, the repositories won't be available. You won't, get, you won't be able to install any new systems on CentOS Linux 7. Um, <clears throat> that's why Red Hat Enterprise Linux has... Um, I don't think I have the slide in this deck. I should have added it. Uh, but we at Summit... Let me double check. Nope. <coughs> so at Summit, we announced a... Uh, a subscription offering for Convert to RHEL. So what that means is you can actually get uh, support for your CentOS Linux 7 systems uh, that you then convert to RHEL 7 systems. Now, for this to work, you need to be on RHEL 7.9, and then uh, you need to do an in-place conversion from uh, CentOS Linux 7.9 to RHEL 7.9, and then as part of this offering, as part of this Convert to RHEL offering, it's... Oh, uh, gosh, it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux support for third-party Linux distribution, something like that. Again, I didn't name these things. I just tell, I'm just i just telling you about them. Um, but uh, but this, this conversion subscription uh, for third-party Linux uh, actually has that ELS two-year extension built in. <coughs> and that's that, that first use case that I mentioned, or that, that's the second use case that I mentioned where Convert your systems from CentOS Linux to RHEL 7, so that you've got uh, so that you've you've got that uh, support for two years, and then work on moving all those workloads onto something like RHEL 8.8 .8 or 9.2. So that's convert to RHEL. In place upgrades just keeps getting better, and I just realized I don't have this deck. I don't have this slide in here either. At Summit, I had this. Uh, I had a slide where it showed RHEL 6 or it uh, showed uh, RHEL 7 with a leap to RHEL 8 and a leap to RHEL 9 and a leap to RHEL 10 uh, marked off as future. Um, so this doesn't, this doesn't really show you that, but leap is the tool going forward for the foreseeable future for RHEL in-place upgrades. So I noticed there's, there's some conversation going on in the chat about how uh, it's not an inconsequential amount of work to do an in-place upgrade. RHEL 6 and RHEL 7, definitely true. Rel eight to rel nine, it is so smooth. It is it is quick. If if my rel seven to eight boxes were doing in place upgrades in sixteen to eighteen minutes, rel eight to rel nine on vanilla systems, consumer hardware, all the all the same caveats I gave before, I can probably do that in ten to twelve minutes. <coughs> now those are not official. Um, those are not, are not official times, but it gives you a ballpark estimate of how long you can do that. Then you can use tools like Red Hat Insights, Red Hat Satellite, or Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform to do those conversions and or in-place upgrades at scale. So while I'm doing this as a one-off, as a demonstration, you can do it with hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of systems. Uh, I just talked to a customer at Summit who's doing a 30,000 node in-place upgrade. And if that doesn't make you sweat as as one of the technical uh, <laughs> one of the technical team that helps work on this, I don't know what will. Thirty thousand nodes in place upgrade over the course of I think two quarters. So I mean it's it is unbelievable how well Leap has improved over the last couple of major releases, and it's going to be the release uh, It's going to be the in place upgrade mechanism for Rel ten as well. So this is what I'm saying: get into a cadence, start upgrading alongside of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And you won't end up in the situation where you're kind of stuck. So I kind of hinted at this. This is that second uh, workflow I was talking about, where <coughs> you can use something like Image Builder. This is one of my favorite tools, or an entire portfolio of tools. Um, <coughs> so when you're running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you can actually use Image Builder to define what your image looks like. And there's three different ways you can do this. It's there's a command line tool. There's a web console uh, application uh, that you see here, and then there's the console uh, version uh, that's part of the Red Hat Insights suite of tools. Um, so what we're looking at is a screenshot from my home lab here um, from just about two weeks ago. Uh, <coughs> and uh, Image Builder used to follow a wizard-like 
very linear approach to finding your images. But if you're like me, you might think that, okay, so I need to add these users. And, oh, yeah, I would forgot the, this, this group of database users needs these tools. And, oh, yeah, I forgot to add our service account for, for our Ansible playbook, so I need to go back to users. I don't build my systems out linearly. A, a wizard just doesn't, doesn't match with, with my scatterbrain. So we've moved to, so uh, the web console piece has moved to, um, um, uh, so image builder in the web console has moved to this beautiful card system uh, to where you can kind of click and choose what you want to work on, <coughs> much like the Anaconda installer has been for, what, decades? And, uh, and then two of the other features that I'm really excited about is uh, OpenSCAP profiles. So if you are using PCI, um, or CIS, or HIPAA, or one of the other uh, one of the other tools, or, or one of the other certifications from a global uh, entity that your systems are required to meet. You can actually include those OpenSCAP profiles in your image, so it'll come predefined with all of those things. So, like custom file systems, um, certain package sets uh, be installed or uninstalled. All that comes predefined in your blueprint now. And speaking of blueprints, probably the next coolest feature is the ability to import and export blueprint files. So think about this. You can go and build an image builder um, blueprint, which is basically a TOML file. You can upload that into a Git repository, so it's version controlled, but you can also tie that into uh, CI/CD pipelines. Um, you can uh, define your company's golden image and then export that TOML file and give that to all of your development team. So they are literally, they can literally take their laptop, spin up an official virtual machine that exactly matches production and do their development against that platform. Think about this too. And, and if you're a partner out there or somebody who builds on top of RHEL, hear me please, because this is going to change how you do business with RHEL customers. Imagine Put yourself in my shoes about a decade ago when I was a RHEL systems administrator and the predominant workload that I worked on was Oracle Rack Databases. And if you, if you ever worked on that like I did, you remember that there was like a six or seven page black and white PDF that you had to download. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting choked up. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> So uh, there's a six or seven page PDF you had to download and it was all the kernel parameters, there's all the packages that need to be installed, um, everything that Oracle Rack expected to be in place or tuned in order to actually run Rack successfully on top of RHEL. Um, imagine instead going to the Oracle, uh, your Oracle customer portal or Microsoft SQL Server portal and downloading, uh, instead of downloading the installation or downloading the repo configuration file, instead you download a single TOML file, import that into your image builder, and then add your, add your company specific things like your systems administrators, adding all their user accounts or SSH keys. Um, maybe you use Vim and Tmux side by side on all of your servers to do management. Imagine what it would be like to run uh, vendor defined blueprints that you just download off their website, import into your own image builder, and you're literally building out the images exactly as the vendor would ask you to build them out. Add your, add your custom environment stuff on top and you are good to go. I mean, think about, think about how much smoother building out new images will become when you can import and export those files, when you can version control them, when you can build the OpenSCAP profiles directly into the image. This is just the tip of the iceberg, and I am so excited for RHEL 9.3 and 8.9 this fall. Yes, we're already talking about that, because I can't wait to see what the community and what all of you do with that and what the Image Builder team is going to add in to the next version of Image Builder, because a lot of this stuff, the, the customized file systems, the custom uh, package lists, the OpenSCAP security profiles, importing and exporting of blueprints, all of that is driving towards a more of a single one-stop shop to build out your custom images. Okay, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about Image Builder. We'll be talking about that more in the coming weeks on, uh, on this channel and on the product blog, uh, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna cover a few more things. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, 
<clears throat> clearly on the struggle bus today. Sorry. <clears throat> so one of the pillars was protect and trust. Uh, those were two of the pillars, half of them, in fact. Um, and one of the things that RHEL 9 is really good about doing is introducing more sane defaults out of the box. Of course, you can go and turn that. You can go and, and change that based on your environment needs. But the, the defaults are more sane out of the box. Again, definitely picking on uh, SSH server and not being able to log in anymore as a root uh, here in 2023. <clears throat> but we've also got uh, the ability to now use a system role to register your systems with... Um, with Microsoft Active Directory. So if you're running in Azure or if you're in a Windows heavy environment, you can now register your RHEL systems with Microsoft Active Directory using nothing but a system role. And if you're unfamiliar, system roles are basically very, very small, customizable, Ansible playbooks that manage a specific service, whether it's SSH, whether it's the kernel, whether it's web console, or now uh, Microsoft Active Directory Realm D authentication. Um, so workloads, I've, I've talked a little bit about Microsoft SQL Server, um, <clears throat> as well as gaining access to the Microsoft uh, Active Directory integration. Um, so you can now log into your SQL Server using AD authentication. Uh, you are also able to use uh, Microsoft SQL Server with always on availability groups. So if you're a Microsoft SQL Server uh, user, I think uh, my buddy Nate has got some content coming out about that uh, later on this quarter. Sorry, I'm kind of trying to hit the highlights here because I'm running out of time. Uh, so Web Console. So if you are a new Linux administrator or if you're a Windows administrator that occasionally has to manage uh, Linux systems or if you're like me and just certain operations work better visually, um, probably my favorite uh, tool in the Web Console is the disk partition layout because I can actually see here's my disk, here's how much of it's used, I want to grow it this much, cool. We're all said and done, click, 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 I'm done. I don't have to go through... I remember, was it PV create or PV extend or, okay, I forgot. Let me go, let me go look this up real quick. <coughs> so some of the new changes are you can actually change the crypt cryptographic policy system wide through the web console. Uh, you can manage groups um, now through the accounts page. <coughs> you can actually use NBDE through the web console now. And, um, no web, no graphical uh, utility is worth its weight in bits until it has, drumroll, dark mode. So now there is a dark theme uh, for the web console. So you better believe that when RHEL 9.2 went GA, I went into my home lab and changed all of my defaults over to dark mode. Um, so um, that, that, that has been a running joke with our team for the last several weeks that uh, web console has finally hit its stride now that it has dark mode. I mentioned system roles. I think there's over 20 RHEL system roles. They're based on the upstream Linux system roles project that you can find out on GitHub. But we've introduced four new system roles uh, with 9.2. That's Podman. So you can now manage the Podman engine using a system role, RHC, Red Hat Connector, Journal D, and AD integration. Uh, of course, IT's uh, our product manager, Brian Smith, on RHEL Presents as often as I can that I'm, I'm still waiting on my system role to manage all of my system roles. Um, I haven't seen that pop up on the roadmap, so. <laughs> <coughs> also, I'm hoping to work with John Spinks, our technical marketer, or our technical, uh, my, my technical counterpart with Red Hat Insights, to either do an episode of RHEL Presents or hopefully even a Red Hat Insights on RHEL miniseries uh, to talk about all the new things that are coming out with Red Hat Insights. If you haven't registered your system with Insights, you are definitely missing out. I would need a whole hour to talk about uh, all the changes that came to Red Hat Insights. The announcements that we made this past uh, this past week at Red Hat Summit were actually expanding the Insights suite of tools uh, to include a lot of functionality that you might expect to see in something like a Red Hat satellite. So if you're more cloud-based, um, keep an eye on the Red Hat Insights announcements uh, coming up because there will be more, uh, there'll be expanded services that you can actually utilize through Insights on top of already, um, <clears throat> on top of already uh, tools like Advisor that'll let you know that certain certain configurations might might uh, lead to issues or resource optimization that says, hey, this this uh, the system only is utilized like 11% of the time. You might consider uh, scaling it back to save on some dollars. 
um, also being able to manage subscriptions. Uh, there's a growing suite of tasks, things like the pre-upgrade analysis at scale that I mentioned when we were talking about Leap. You can actually run that Leap pre-upgrade analysis across an entire fleet or a subset of your systems using console.redhat.com. Uh, and it'll let you know <coughs> if there are certain inhibitors to your upgrade, or if there are certain critical uh, configuration changes that you may want to make to avoid any outages or issues with the upgrade itself. Um, you can actually do that at scale and get a full-fledged report that you can then share uh, with, uh, with your uh, change management team or your leadership or your fellow uh, systems administrators. So I know that that 90 seconds on Red Hat Insights doesn't do nearly enough justice for what has been announced in the past couple of months, but hopefully that'll keep you coming back for more. Um, of course, talking about Red Hat Enterprise Linux as a developer-friendly platform wouldn't be complete without giving a hat tip to all the new uh, versions of some of the languages and runtimes that are available as part of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9.2. So there's updates to PCP, Grafana, Python. Nginx actually has a new application stream now, so you can uh, so you can change what uh, what app stream you're using for Nginx, PostgreSQL, and a whole bunch more. Uh, in fact, at the end of the deck, uh, and so in the show notes, I will include a link to developers.redhat.com. They have an outstanding blog on how uh, on what some some of the new language capabilities are with the latest version of RHEL 9.2. Uh, or you can check our Twitter feed. I'm pretty sure we've we've posted those there as well. If you're a container user, because um, be, because containers are not just OpenShift, it is we call it a container continuum um, between running a single container on a RHEL Edge system to to running dozens of, of uh, Podman pods on your RHEL systems, um, to then, of course, using uh, OpenShift as well. But on RHEL local, <coughs> if you're running Podman in your RHEL systems, uh, RHEL 9.2 sees an update to Podman, Builda, and Scopio, the, and I think there's one other. Uditsa, I think, is, is also part of that suite of tools. But you can now run an audit on your Podman images on, upon creation, uh, probably one of the coolest ones that I've seen is the ability to define custom actions on health check. So if a pod comes back reporting it's unhealthy, you can actually give Podman a list of uh, actions to take to correct that. And then we're, of course, doing more with SigStore support for being able to build, distribute, and digest uh, trusted uh, container images. Also... I will admit uh, that because this is tech preview, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. But I am told that Quadlet is the the new uh, the the new hotness when it comes to running containers on RHEL. Uh, so Quadlet is System D container integration made portable. <coughs> and if you've been playing with Quadlet or if you've heard of it, is now tech preview in RHEL 9.2, which means that the early functionality is available in the distribution. Um, but it is not recommended for uh, production use case right now. However, um, if you use Podman as an as an obfuscation layer for your service for your workloads, uh, a lot of my Podman pods here at home running C file and Minecraft and Plex and whatnot actually run as system D services, but it's Podman under the hood. Quadlet is apparently like the new coolness. So we're going to try and get someone from the Podman team on this channel here in the near future to talk about Quadlet and uh, what all the buzz is about. <clears throat> and if you're on this channel and you, if, if you're watching this and you've made it this far and you don't use RHEL in your home lab, or if you don't have a developer subscription for individuals, I highly recommend right now go to developers.redhat.com and register for a D4i subscription. Developer subscription for individuals gives you a number of RHEL uh, entitlements, entitlements. So my home lab actually runs using nothing but developer, subscri uh, developer subscription for individuals, D4i. Um, <clears throat> they're self-support and uh, you can run physical or virtual nodes so you can run RHEL proper uh, in your home lab or for s uh, small individual use cases. This is not for um, <clears throat> this is not for big businesses. It's not for corporate use. We do have a similar program, but you'll need to talk to your account rep about that, uh, about developer subscription for Teams. <clears throat> Edge, uh, tune back in in uh, two weeks, a week and a half, basically, because we're going to be talking to Ben Briard, our product manager for RHEL for the Edge, and we're actually going to bring on OnLogic, one of our Edge partners, to talk about um, to talk about uh, RHEL for Edge. So there's uh, so I, I won't go into detail on the slide, 
uh, because I don't want to spoil any uh, any of the uh, upcoming what's new on RAL Presents. But I will say that uh, image blueprint customizations are getting uh, more and more uh, detailed for what you can build into your edge images using Image Builder. But we've also included uh, now ignition support for edge image builder built images. Um, so if you if you prefer something like ignition over Kickstart, uh, there's support in the edge builder for that now. All right. That is a ton of information. There's a couple of questions that I want to get to, but I will highly encourage you to go to lab.redhat.com. We've got in play, or we've got um, self-paced labs. They're free to, free to use. You can go in, spend 10, 15 minutes learning a task, whether that's inter, whether that's admin 101, how do I create and manage a user, or whether that's how do I do an in-place upgrade uh, from RHEL. Uh, I think it's I, I'm getting ready to rebase it on RHEL 8 to 9. Um, but lab.redhat.com. Also, if you're if you're new to our channel, this is actually live on YouTube right now, um, and uh, we've got a pair of shows, uh, one every Friday, uh, called one called Into the Terminal, which gets uh, gets down into the weeds of the command line and how to do certain tasks as a systems administrator, obviously from a RHEL perspective, but it's it's fairly Linux applicable. Uh, this Friday, I forgot the topic. So check uh, check the check the uh, hit hit the subscribe button uh, because I've, I forgot what the topic is and then of course I teased Rel presents quite a bit which is our product and industry focused show uh, I host that with uh, with uh, Brian Smith and Nate Lager uh, every other Wednesday so definitely uh, hit hit that notification bell as well so you can um, so you can be notified um, of any time we're going to go live. Also, I've teased it a few times, developers.redhat.com. It's a blog. It's a product announcement page for development tools. It's the home of the developer subscription, as well as a huge community. And I think they even still have a live conference once a year um, to talk more about development on RHEL. Also, if you are a big fan of Red Hat, if you're a big fan of RHEL, uh, we would love to talk to you. Go to red.ht slash accelerators to join uh, to uh, to look at joining our accelerators program. It is our Red Hat champion program, uh, or it is our champion program here at Red Hat. So basically what that means is if you're a big fan, we'll send you some swag, we'll get some feedback. Granted, it's a little bit more involved in that, uh, but basically that's kind of how it works. We we pick your brain, you get you get to see, uh, like this deck uh, I presented to our accelerator team about uh, three days before GA. Uh, sometimes it's more like a week, but... Uh, but, you know, scheduling. Uh, so if you're interested in a higher level of communication with Red Hat, definitely go to red.ht slash accelerators. So we've covered a ton of content, and I want to spend the last few minutes here uh, addressing your questions. And um, But also to thank you, because 58 minutes of listening to me ramble in a one-sided conversation and all the rabbit trails, I understand uh, that's, that's quite a lot. Um, uh, spending an hour watching essentially a webinar is a lot for any of us to do, especially in a post COVID world. Um, so I really do truly appreciate you sticking around, uh, being engaged in the chat, asking questions and, uh, listening to me talk about all that's new in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9.2. So with that said, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I'm going to scroll back up here in chat. Uh, let's see. Okay, so there we were talking about Leap. <coughs> Although uh, I saw a question here about uh, accelerators come in. You do not have to be a member of uh, Big Corp to, uh, to be considered for an accelerator. Uh, small to medium-sized businesses uh, are, are, uh, are welcome as well. In fact, um, admittedly, small to medium-sized use cases is something that we've not communicated well. So maybe if you are in a small to medium-sized business running RHEL or wanting to run RHEL, you should definitely look into the accelerators program and help us understand better how to talk to folks in your shoes. Um, a lot of my time was spent in mid-market, both as a systems administrator and as a, uh, um, and as a salesperson. Uh, yes, I, I did spend about two and a half years of my career in, in uh, sales solutions, solutions architecture. Uh, before I came over to the dark side where they give me a microphone and a YouTube channel to go and, and talk to things about. But uh, but anyway, you do not need to be a, quote, a big customer uh, to be considered to be an accelerator. Uh, we we really always looking for all, all sorts of people. 
Um, let's see. <coughs> so, uh, I, I get this question about CentOS Linux to CentOS Stream quite often. Um, since CentOS Linux didn't have uh, paid support anyway, why not? Uh, why not go to CentOS Stream? Um, so here's here's the thing, and if if you spend any time on this. Um, if you spend any time on this channel and listen to me present about anything, you know that it's, it's kind of bittersweet for me to see CentOS Linux going away. Um, however, it was causing a lot of issues in um, for folks that depended upon CentOS Linux for their production use cases. Uh, there's been a few times in CentOS Linux's history where maintainers would uh, go AFK for a while uh, and major releases would sometimes take, you know, Nine, nine to twelve months to to show up, um, and and what the industry is kind of realizing is we're not we may be we may get a free operating system, but the problem is that do you really want to stake your your multi million or multi billion dollar company on something that's community driven? Um, please understand. Uh, one of the reasons why I am on the CentOS Convert to Rel team is because I, I understand. I, I ran environments that were all sent to us, but I've also been awake at 2 a.m. arguing with people on Stack Exchange that won't just answer my question because, we're sorry, you included a salutation at the beginning of your post. We're not going to answer until you remove that salutation. Or, we're sorry, you didn't provide enough technical information. Mm, no, it's 2 a.m. I've got a production outage. I'm exhausted. I just want someone to help me fix the issue. And that's where having paid support, that's where partnering with someone like Red Hat really comes into play. Now, CentOS Stream is amazing in its own right, and I'm hoping to talk uh, about CentOS Stream at some point, either on this channel or uh, on a different venue or on a different platform, because the ability to start developing for the next generation of operating system, I don't mean RHEL 10, I mean RHEL 10 and beyond. And the, the ability for Red Hat Engineering to do that out in public is amazing. The the activity, the flurry of activity we see with things like the SIG, special interest groups, things like the hyperscaler SIG, things like um, the, um, uh, not AI, um, in-vehicle OS uh, SIG, are doing incredible work where it's not just Red Hatters, or it's not just Red Hatters and a partner. It is Red Hatters, our partners, other players in the space, and just the ability to develop for the next generation of, of technology is amazing, and that's what CentOS Stream was designed to do. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. <coughs> uh, all right, so scrolling down, I know we're over time. I uh, appreciate those of you that have sticking around with me. Um, let's see. So Shantanu asks, did the rel limit of two versions support change? The max for rel 6 would be rel 8, correct? I'm afraid I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, but each, each major version has its own, uh, life cycle. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, um, so I definitely suggest here in a couple of hours, I'll have the show notes done. Uh, so look at the life cycle page to understand, uh, what, what's available when, uh, let's see. So Aaron, Aaron jokes that he found a bug in Image Builder immediately after 9.2 dropped. Thank you for reporting that because I know that we were working on a summit session uh, around Image Builder and OpenSCAP and we provided like <laughs> six bugs, I think, when we were building that. So, you know, hey, more eyes. Uh, all, all, all what, what is it that Linus says? that? Uh, um, anyway, more eyes, better, better product. Um, so someone says I said Oracle Rack too many times in a sentence. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so kind of an ongoing conversation about CentOS Stream. This is why we've started having uh, producers for our live streams so that the host isn't vamping while scrolling through chat. Um, so has anything really changed with the RHEL uh, development subscription? No, not really. Uh, not in some time. We're just trying to do a better job of promoting it. Um, because I really wished when I was a systems administrator to understand how to subscribe my systems and get the right repositories enabled uh, in my home lab because um, because CentOS didn't have any of that layer of complexity. Um, so I kind of wished um, I kind of wished that I had that then. 
So apparently I need to be on IRC. If you notice my, my connect page at the beginning, uh, I'm most everywhere. I'm uh, maybe in, maybe send me a list of places that I, I need to be to have that conversation. Uh, let's see. Okay. So that kind of, kind of brings us to the end of chat. Um, so I really, really, really thank you all for joining me. Really appreciate you tuning in. Um, please leave uh, notes in the comments if you found this to be useful. Um, now, I, I love Rel Presents and I love End of the Terminal, um, but sometimes you just need kind of a more straightforward, point-to-point, -point, uh, slide-driven, I know, um, sort of presentation. Now, we are going to be using things like Rel Presents and End of the Terminal and some of our tech tip videos to develop more content like this around uh, around the upcoming, uh, or in a lot of the features that I, I talked about today, we're planning episodes, blogs, and videos uh, in the near future. So bear with us as we produce those. We're all kind of bouncing back from Summit. So, uh, and then I don't know about some of my colleagues, but now this week all my kids are home from school. So, you know, there's, there's release, Summit, kids, then I'm going to start recording videos. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for joining me. Really appreciate the time and attention. Uh, please leave your comments uh, down below. Make sure to like and subscribe and uh, let us know uh, what, uh, what content you'd love to see from us. Thank you all. And we'll see you on Friday for End of the Terminal.